Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Kuchu. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. And today we have on with us Guy Ziskin, who is a, the CEO of the Enigma project. Uh, and we'll be learning about that today. Uh, Guy, could you uh, please introduce yourself? Sure. So, uh, yes, my name is uh, Guy. I am... Uh co-founder, CEO of Enigma. Enigma started as a project back in 2015 when I was a graduate student at MIT. Started as a research around privacy-preserving computation, its relation to the blockchain, and particularly how can we use uh, these kind of privacy-preserving technologies to add privacy to blockchains as a whole. Cool. So uh, how did you like, you know, originally get interested in uh, MPC? Like, you know, you wrote this paper back in 2015 while you were at MIT. Uh, what originally intrigued you with that problem? So actually, first of all, I got really interested in blockchain technology. I first of all, I got interested in Bitcoin. I was fascinated by the idea that, you know, you could basically decentralize a ledger uh, even though you have untrusted peers, I thought this was fascinating. There must be a lot more that you can do with it. And then a group of guys, we we basically started a project around trying to use uh, blockchain for like other kind of applications, especially identity, uh, data privacy. But very quickly we realized that there's very strong limitations for blockchain. There's a lot of limitations because blockchain is inherently fully public, and there's so much you can do. And that's even without discussing the scalability issues. And I was really fascinated about how can we make uh, people, users, uh, better tools for them to control their own data and their own privacy. And I was also interested in how can companies you know, reduce liabilities that they have with storing sensitive data. And that really got me interested into this field of uh, secure multi-party computation and how it relates to the blockchain. I see. And so... What inspired you to like take this like research, which was more like an academic work? Your master's thesis was on like the efficient, secure computation. What inspired you to take this academic research and then turn it into a company and like a public blockchain project? Or was that always sort of the intention from the get go? So the intention from the get go was to do something that I'm passionate about and that actually can, you know, really change our day-to-day -day lives for the better. I know this is a cliche, but the, the goal was really to do something big. Luckily, MIT is really a great place to do those kind of things. And when I you know, wrote the first paper and then circulated the Enigma white paper, and I was also heavily involved in the MIT uh, DCI and MIT Bitcoin kind of ecosystem, like I guess all of these things kind of fed each other and it very quickly became apparent that the best way to do this, you know, beyond the initial research was to actually move outside of academia and actually try to do it. Whether it's a company, it's a foundation, it's an organization, it doesn't matter. The goal, the goal was and is to create something that a lot of people can use and that would influence a lot of people's lives. Okay, well, let's hop right into it then. Uh, I mean, starting with one of the core um, aspects of Enigma, which is privacy preservation. And so, you know, if, if we look back at you know, the history of blockchains, and specifically starting with Bitcoin, so transparency, there, there's always been this sort of delicate balance between transparency and privacy. You know, um, Bitcoin blockchain is, of course, uh, open and public. And so inherently, the information is available for everyone. But there's this sort of pseudo anonymity where uh, no one is really aware or technically in theory uh, isn't aware of who's behind the transactions. So as time has evolved, you know, some people sort of agreed with that. Others saw it as uh, potentially, you know, a vulnerability. And we've seen sort of companies grow into this space that are now analyzing uh, the Bitcoin blockchain and, and other blockchains to uh, extract certain types of information from it. And of course, you know, now we have Zcash and we have these privacy preserving blockchains. Um, so in, in this context, can you maybe perhaps describe what are the different types of privacy problems that one can run into if 
while, while using public blockchains to you know run smart contracts uh execute transactions financial transactions and this type of thing i think there are two types of privacy that people care about today and that's very much like uh how blockchains have evolved in the last few years so there are like transactional blockchains right bitcoin all of the so many forks that exist, anything that relates to transfer of money and transfer of value. And for this, we have a lot of privacy solutions like Monero, like Zcash, like so many others that are just popping every day. But there is a, another dimension to what blockchain and consensus technology, permissionless consensus technology can bring us. And that's what we've seen with smart contracts and with Ethereum. But I believe the problem with smart contracts is actually much, much bigger and much harder to solve. Because you know, when you're talking about Bitcoin, all you need to hide, which is again, as we're seeing, really not easy, is you know, the, the amounts and the sender and recipient. When you're talking about uh, smart contracts, there's a whole state. There's arbitrary state, arbitrary data, arbitrary computations, and all the nodes in the network see all of that. So to me, focusing on solving that privacy issue is kind of like the other big thing that we, we should divert our efforts to. What, what are some existing technologies that exist in order to uh, do privacy preserving uh, state? Or is there a sort of a body of research that exists before the, you know, the, introduction of, uh, the introduction of Bitcoin and Ethereum and blockchains? Or is this field of computer science you know, new and very much tied to like this industry? So I'd say this uh, body of research started around the same time that the body of research around consensus started, maybe even a bit earlier. So both of these are like 30, 40 years old body of researches. There's a lot of literature. Uh, this whole subfield is called secure computation, just like we have consensus, uh, distributed consensus and Byzantine fault tolerance in distributed systems. Both of these have been here for a long while. I think what has changed in the last decade is that there's a lot of efficiency gains that have been made to both. Many are related to blockchain, at least in the, in the consensus aspect. In a secure computation, I'm not sure it's as much related to blockchain as it just is that more researchers are interested in it and the effects of big data have kind of made this a requirement of how to protect data privacy while computing. Interesting. So at the core, and perhaps correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's three different types of approaches to preserving privacy in a blockchain. So one is doing secure multi-party computation, and I'll let you explain what that means specifically, but I think just in, in that term, you know, one can imagine what that entails. Then zero knowledge proofs, which uh, most of our listeners will be familiar with, at least at some level. And the third is uh, trust execution environments, uh, which we've also talked about on the show. And so people may, may be familiar with technologies like Intel SGX and its ability to uh, perform computation in, in, a, in a secure environment. Is this the uh, sort of exhaustive types of approaches to uh, enabling privacy on a blockchain? Uh, are there other methods? And could you perhaps describe more in detail how each of them preserves privacy and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each solution? Of course. So these solutions, they're not you know, unique to blockchains, but they are very efficient for blockchains. Uh, there's a few others like fully homomorphic encryption, which is uh, amazingly theoretical, but we don't really know how to do it well enough in practice. And there are other solutions that are more targeted and pinpointed. So it's probably not worth discussing. But of the three that you mentioned, there is, uh, uh, as you said, the secure multi-party computation. Secure multi-party computation is basically the idea that you, know, you can't trust one computer or like one entity with your data. But if you can have a network of computers, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 100, uh, as long as you can know that you know, some fraction of them would not collude with the others, then your data will basically remain encrypted at all times, and they can still run computations over it as a network. So that's in MPC. I'm happy to go into more detail with that. Trusted execution environments are a similar idea that say 
there is you know an enclave, there is a trusted region in the in the processor where you can kind of push all data and all code in. Uh, every computation that happens inside that uh, region cannot be accessed from the outside. So that is how you can basically achieve uh, privacy preserving computation using that. And the third one is zero knowledge proofs. So zero knowledge proofs, many don't know this, but it's actually been developed very closely together uh, several decades ago with multi-party computations. Zero knowledge proofs are the idea that if I have some data and I want to run some computation over that data, then I can prove to you without revealing the data that the result of that computation was indeed correctly computed. And I don't have to reveal anything else. I'd say that you know, in this context, um, secure multi-party computation and trusted execution environments are similar. They have very different threat models and deployment models, but they both enable computers and, and people to run computations over data that they cannot see. If I'm a computer in a trusted execution environment or as part of an MPC network, I am not seeing the data that I am actually computing over. Where it comes to zero knowledge proofs, by definition, I have to have the access. If I'm the prover that is proving some computation, I need to have access to the data, but I don't have to reveal that data to anyone else. So th this to make sure I get this right, the difference here is like in zero knowledge proofs, it's I want to prove, I want to do the computation and keep the pr data private so I can have a private input, run the computation myself and give you the private output and I never have to give you the input. But if I'm trying to outsource the computation, then you know zero knowledge proofs don't really help in this situation because whoever's running the computation needs to know about the inputs. And that's where the secure multi-party computation comes in. Is that, is that about right? That is very much right. And that is also true if you want to combine different data from different users, right? Like if you're doing, if you're trying to do it, like if you're trying to do, uh, you know, a secure auction, for example, then all the users will need to send someone their bids. That, that entity, that person can then uh, prove that they computed the winner correctly and only reveal that, but that person, and with a zero knowledge proof, but that person would still need to see all the bids. So this is kind of like, you know, one of the drawbacks of using some, when you use something like Zcash is it's very uh, computationally expensive for the uh, users of Zcash because if they want any privacy, they sort of have to do these currently very expensive snark computations themselves. And there's really no way to outsource that computation without basically leaking their privacy. And so is this something that like the realm of where like, uh, the secure multi-party computation, it will like be able to solve that problem. Right, so obviously secure multi-party computation does has its uh, overhead as well, but in many computations and in many cases, being, you know, doing a multi-party computation is faster than being a prover in a big enough circuit. So, and you can definitely outsource it to some other parties and the users don't have to participate in the computation there are benefits for users to still participate in the computation, but they don't, they don't, they don't have to. So yes. Okay. So now let's like, you know, delve in a little bit into the Enigma project. And so we have these like different uh, ways of doing things, uh, privacy preserving technologies. And, you know, your goal was to create a privacy preserving public blockchain network. And so how are you kind of deciding which of these avenues to focus on and go down? That's, a, that's actually a very good question because there's a lot to do, right? And, we, I, and I still believe very much that despite the kind of adversarial aspect that a lot of people take in the space and think, you know, it's like there can only be one. I very much believe that like we're still building all the building blocks and we are here to collaborate and kind of feed off each other. So it's great to kind of work together and see like how we can help other projects. So with that said, the way that we started is basically by focusing on what we call the compute layer. So the way we conceptualize, you know, the, the full Enigma protocol is that there are two big pieces of it. One piece is the verifier and that's a blockchain. The blockchain should only really get proofs of computations, right? And results. 
and basically store them over time and deal with payments. But it should not do heavy lifting computations. That is also similar to other philosophies from other projects uh, like Truebit. But to be honest, this has already appeared in the 2015 Enigma white paper. So we, we shared that belief even before it became so well known. The other layer is the compute layer. That's basically where nodes can run privacy-preserving computations at higher scale because not every node in the network has to run all computations. Uh, and they can do that either using trusted execution environments, which is what we have right now in the first release, uh, or they can do that as a secure multi-party computation protocol, which is what we're going to release later on, probably next year. Maybe we should start with then the uh, current uh, implementation that you have now and then go talk into the secure multi-party one later. So, you know, you guys released your first version, like version 1.0 recently uh, and have a public test net uh, using the trusted execution environment system. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you have in this like version one and what it uh, really does? It's, it's actually pretty cool because version one, the way we built it uh, is that it's very easy for developers, for example, in Ethereum to, to get going. The way that it's done today, and that's what I mean about like, you know, we're choosing our balance and we're choosing what to focus on. So the way that it works right now is that you write just a regular smart contract in Solidity and you deploy that to Ethereum. We have some API that, you know, under the hood registers that as an Enigma secret contract. That's what we call smart contracts that, you know, can deal with pri private data. And the way that it works is that you can designate specific computations, specific functions as functions that you want to run in a privacy preserving way. The way you do that is that uh, users can basically encrypt all of their inputs. And there's some uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman happening between a user and one of the Enigma nodes that, you know, uh, and one of the enclaves in the Enigma nodes. Uh, to basically generate an encryption key that the user can use. The user then encrypts uh, inputs to a later computation and pushes that as a transaction to Ethereum to that smart contract state. Then uh, users can actually call a function execution of that smart contract to happen in Enigma. What then happens is that the bytecode is being loaded into an, one of the Enigma nodes. We call these a worker node. This worker node uh, pushes that bytecode inside the enclave and pushes the encrypted arguments from the Ethereum blockchain inside the enclave. And then the enclave and only the enclave can decrypt that information because only the enclave has the, the right information to, to derive the, the key. Decrypts the information, runs the computation in, in an EVM inside of the enclave and then uh, pushes out the output and commits that back to Ethereum. So you can really do interesting things, like you can have a smart contract in Ethereum today, but if you have like, you know, uh, very sensitive functionalities like voting, you, know, you, don't, you don't want the votes to be public, or like auctions, or like random number generation, or many, many other ideas, you can basically offload them to Enigma and then push the result back to your smart contract in Ethereum. So that's what we have today. So I just want to look at this from uh, an, an application developer's perspective. So let's say, for example, that I'm building some sort of a voting app, which is a great example because you, know, you want your votes to, to remain private. I build my DAP uh, just as I would you know, if I was building it in a non-privacy preserving way. But then where, where I got lost is how does the Enigma blockchain or network retrieve data from the smart contract? Is the Enigma network parsing the Ethereum blockchain, or is the smart contract sending data to Enigma? So uh, all the Enigma workers, they basically they have a connection to the Ethereum blockchain, right? The way that this works is, imagine you have a voting application, smart contract. Uh, you have to write the smart contract in a way that, uh, you know, it can store a blob, like just a, an array of encrypted uh, votes. What then happens is that every users that want to cast their vote can basically send a transaction like, you know, add vote or like store vote. And that vote itself is encrypted with a key that only the enclave in Enigma can know. 
it, it, there's a, some more details, but I'm, you know, I'm removing them for simplicity. All those votes, encrypted votes, are just stored in the smart contract state in Ethereum. Ethereum doesn't understand these encrypted votes. This is just like random, random junk to Ethereum. But basically, the user can then submit a request uh, to the Ethereum blockchain to run a computation uh, that should run on Enigma. Uh, that actually spins out an event, spits out an event, right? The node, all, all Enigma worker nodes are basically listening to those events coming in. It picks up the computation. It takes the computation from Ethereum. On Ethereum, nothing really happens. It only happens on Enigma. Enigma takes that computation, runs the logic of that function. What I didn't mention is that the user needs to point to the encrypted arguments that are already stored in the contract. The Enigma, the Enigma node knows how to parse it. So what it does is it sends the encrypted arguments from the Ethereum smart contract inside the enclave. It sends, it pushes the bytecode from Ethereum for that function. Let's say the function is, you know, tally votes. Uh, pushes that into the enclave. The enclave then decrypts all the votes submitted from all users uh, and just, you know, sums them up, sees like who's been voted, and then pushes the decrypted result back to Ethereum. So on the Ethereum side, it's kind of like, you know, you explained that they're writing all their stuff in Solidity and they just, their smart contract just has to know how to, to accept this encrypted data and like sort of pass the data out and bring it back in. What are they writing on the uh, SGX side? So like what, uh, I know the SGX, the bindings currently are mostly in C++. Are the developers having to write like C++ code that runs in the SGX or what, yeah, what are they writing there? So that's really the cool part. They, they don't need to, to do any of that. They just write Solidity code. Uh, they have like a library. It kind of feel, it's kind of like based on Web3, like an extension that allows you to like handle from the user side, from the DApp side, uh, like all the encryption and that kind of stuff and like sending transactions that pass encrypted data and all that. But other than that, the developer doesn't need to understand anything about SGX, anything about like C++ code or anything like that. So then the Enigma network just un understands this, the, the Solidity smart contract, and sort of interprets uh, the code there in a way that it, it will know how to uh, interpret this data given the function that is meant to execute on the data? Exactly, yes. So essentially what you're doing is you're running an EVM inside of the, the enclave. And so anyone can submit any traditional smart contract there. One question I have then is, you know, we talk about like the data being able to be encrypted. Like for example, you know, the votes are encrypted and we send it and they get decrypted in the enclave. Is it possible to decrypt the, uh, to encrypt the contract itself? Like could I encrypt EVM bytecode? and have that be uh, only decryptable in the uh, SGX. So, you know, maybe there's a case where two companies want to have like a private contract together or something. Is that something that's possible? So it's actually, the, there's been an interesting discussion in our forum about that. It's a very small technical change. We don't support it right now, but it's like something that can be done very, very quickly. I, I'm not sure we, we would want the first use cases to be that because if, if you do it that way, yes, it's technically possible. It's very easy to encrypt the bytecode and decrypt it inside the enclave. But at the same time, there's a lot of trust in the person that is basically producing that code, which you, you cannot validate the code. You cannot like test it for like bug, security bugs and stuff like that. So while it is possible, it might not be the first applications we want to encourage. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the uh, security model of the SGX. Is, you know, that's often one of the most concerning things for a lot of people. And quite honestly, for me, it's often a little bit concerning as well. So, you know, oftentimes people kind of like laugh about SGX where it's like, oh, why do you need decentralization when you can just, uh, you know, trust Intel? Um, what do you think about like, you know, how does this SGX trusted hardware security model, how does, what do you think it's a, relationship with like the decentralization is and I actually I think this is a very valid point and we are we are having a lot of conversation about that on where it makes sense where it doesn't and it is also still a work in progress the way that I view this is that like the entire technology stack SGX is another very strong 
part of the toolkit of the tool chain, which we should not dis- discount. I think there's a lot more work to be done there and a lot more research. So when I started researching privacy preserving technologies, three years ago, there was very little in the way of SGX. Actually, one of my uh, advisors um, is actually the, the, the first professor, the first person to, to, to write an extensive paper about SGX and about how it works. And it was around, I think, 2014, 2015. But since then, we've seen a lot more research in that space. And I, and, and I think that's where it is. It's a very much ongoing research on how to harden SGX, on how to improve SGX, and not just SGX, trusted execution environments as a whole. And over time, we need to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. Maybe SGX uh, is okay for integrity, but not for, but not for full privacy. Maybe some aspects are okay, but not all of it. So that's very much an open research question to still look at. I think most concerns that we've been getting around SGX is around the, the ability of like side channel attacks and data leakage. I think there's less concern right now about integrity issues uh, as far as I've been able to gather. So I think that's, again, something to, to figure out. Is SGX okay for correctness, uh, like proving stuff, but less okay for um, privacy? Another aspect to keep in mind is availability. Right? SGX does not give you availability in any way. If a node goes offline, you still need blockchain to penalize them. So that's something that you sh- should be in any case. In the SGX security model, there's like, for me at least, what I see it as is I would prefer to use an SGX for when I'm running my own computation. So, you know, yes, I know there's like all like the Intel stuff with like Spectre, Meltdown, you know, I don't know if we can trust the hardware or 100%, but Let's assume for a moment I say I'm running an Intel CPU, so therefore, you know, screw it, I'll just check, I'll trust my, this, if they are saying that this is some more secure, then, you know, I might as well trust that as well. But that's like, you know, let's say I'm running some very, some program that I need to be extremely secure on my own machine. The problem with what the, in, the SGX is trying to propose to the world is it says, oh, not only do you have to trust your SGX and your personal machine, you have to trust the SGX in someone else's machine. And the problem to me really comes down to the fact is how do you know what's an SGX or not? And currently the way Intel does it is they have this like singular server, basically that's like a remote attestation service, which is like Intel gets to say what is a valid SGX. And the problem is if that one service gets hacked, right? Anyone can create a add a fake public key to that list of valid SGXs and pretend to have an SGX when in reality they don't. And do you think this is like a legitimate threat to the entire security of this, like of of the it, it, SGX side of Enigma, where like it is essentially a singular central point of failure? I'm actually much less concerned about that because I know for a fact that uh, Intel has in their roadmap, they actually want to move away from that. So I think this is very much a temporary thing. I also think trusted execution environments are not limited to SGX, although it is the most widely spread solution right now. So again, I very much think that this is a work in progress to improve these kind of things. Also, there are ways to mitigate right now. There's an interesting thesis about how to reduce the trust in uh, in the Intel attestation service. I, I can't remember the name right now, but there's a thesis about it, and it proposes different models. We've actually employed one similar model, where it's um, basically you you got a very you, you do have to still go through Intel for like you know the first attestation of an enclave, but then after you do that, you generate a key inside the enclave, and that key is used to sign like messages and like you know operations, which is you know some improvement. There's still a lot more to do. But I think we're on the right direction. I think it's going to evolve to a place where that's not that much of a big issue. So coming back to the Enigma network, can you just sort of describe the network topology here? The way I understand SGX is that you don't necessarily need like an enormous amount of nodes. You just need sort of one trusted execution environment that can do the computations. How how many nodes exist in the network? How do they interact together? Are are there multi-party computations over SGX? Is this sort of thing also possible? It is, but let me, that's, that's like jumping uh, a lot ahead. So 
the the way that it works is there's the blockchain and you can think of the blockchain as you know having its own network and its own nodes these nodes can be the same as enigma worker nodes but you know for simplicity let's separate them so in enigma there is a peer to peer network of what we call worker nodes these nodes right now register on chain uh, right now on the ethereum blockchain in the future is going to be in our own chain uh, and basically register and prove that they have a, T capable, a trusted execution environment enabled and you know, they put stake so that they can be penalized if they misbehave uh, and then they can join the network for computations. And the way that it works is that basically for every computation right now, we sample one worker or several workers to, do, to execute that computation. That's kind of the way in a nutshell, there's a lot of optimizations we're working on, but in a nutshell, that's kind of the way that it's being done right now. A lot of these like concerns around the security model that I was discussing around the SGX, that's sort of why it is the first version, but really your long-term goal is to uh, delve into the whole secure multi-party computations, right? Uh, so maybe it's a good time to jump into that. Could you explain to us because like, I don't think many of our viewers are, or listeners are very familiar. What is um, secure multi-party computation? Sure. So before I touch it, I do want to mention that I think what we at Enigma care about the most is to solve the problem of privacy preserving computations at scale, right? And there are different techniques to do it, and we're taking a pragmatic approach. So yes, trusted execution environments are one direction to do that, which works right now and allows people to develop right now. And it is going to be a constant research and constant track to improve, to improve that. At the same time, there are other technologies right now. My personal favorite and what I think is the most promising, uh, and also because I researched that for several years, is secure multi-party computation. So secure multi-party computation actually says this, and it's a good way to move from trusted execution environment to that. It says the following. It says, in an ideal world, we would have like one supercomputer that we can fully trust. That supercomputer, will all, we can outsource computations to, right? And that supercomputer will never leak the data to anyone. It can never be hacked. And it will always compute the correct result. And we can trust it to do that. That is an ideal world. And trusted execution environments try to emulate that in the best way possible with secure hardware. But in practice, we may not want to trust this because you know, there are weaknesses, there are ways, and it's a constant improvement. But can we come up with a better scheme that is based on just cryptographic uh, assumptions? Multi-party computation says the following. Let's say you don't have one computer, but instead you have several untrusted computers. It's very similar to the consensus in blockchain world. You, don't have, you can trust one computer, but you have several untrusted computers. You know, let's make it simple. If you can say that only, that at most half of those computers would be bad, would be like, you know, malicious, would be adversarial, then you're fine. You can, you can consider that network, even though you cannot trust them individually, as a whole, that network would be able to achieve those two properties. It could run any computation with full privacy, which means that data would never leak, not even to the nodes running the computation and never to the outside, and that all computations would uh, complete successfully. So if you get a result, you know it's the right result. That's basically the theory of MPC. Could you uh, maybe like touch into a little bit about like the technical of how it works? Like, you know, from my understanding, there's usually some sort of like, you know, secret sharing that you do and you like, split the uh, data over multiple shard, like you shard the data and you perform computations that are perfectly like, you're probably the best person to describe it. Can you give us a br the viewers a brief summary? Sure. So there are two main techniques to do MPC. One of them is uh, Yao garbage circuits. Uh, it's a bit different. Not going to touch it. The other is using secret sharing. Secret sharing is basically this idea that let's say you have a piece of data. You can split it into N pieces such that any T 
any, so basically any subset of some size, and that's a parameter that you can define. Any, any such subset can basically be used to reconstruct the data. But if you have less than that subset, then no one can reconstruct the data. It's completely random. It's completely useless. So that's the main building block of MPC. And now let's think of an example like that. So let's use the example of a salary, OK? That's usually the example that's given. So let's say you have Alice and Bob. Alice has her salary. Bob has his salary. They want to compute the they want to compute the average, but they don't want anyone to know. They don't want each other to know how much each each of them is making, and they don't want anyone else to know that either. So what do they do? They do an MPC protocol, and and let's say there is now a network of ten nodes. Okay, they can actually do it between themselves, but let's take the example that there is a network of ten nodes that they outsource these to. What Alice does, Alice basically secret shares her salary between all of those 10 nodes. That means that every one of those 10 nodes gets one share of the data. But again, that share cannot be, is completely useless on its own. And let's say that the way this has been designed is that unless you have all the shares, you cannot see the data. Then Bob does the same thing, secret shares his salary uh, to all the nodes. And now each node basically has a share of Alice's age and a share of Bob's age. No node can actually see these salaries, but it turns out that they can go through a multi-party computation protocol to compute the average salary. Because this is a very simple use case, really all, the, all that they need to do is that each node needs to take both salaries, add them together, their own share of the salaries, add them together, divide it by two, and basically run the same computation as if they had the old data. And then what they get is each node gets the share of the result. Now, if you want to see the crypt or reconstruct the result, what they have to do, they have to send both, let's say, Alice and Bob all of the 10 shares of the, that computation that they did. And now Alice and Bob, having all of the shares, can decrypt that information, can reconstruct uh, the result and see what the average salary is. And what do you get? No one learned each other's salary. The network itself, it's even more interesting. The network that you outsource it did not learn anything. It ran a computation, but it did not learn anything about it. The only way to do it is if all of them would be malicious and collude. And that is why you need to put some constraint on the network. In this case, the constraint was that at least one node is honest. In the average scenario, you talk about, you know, you add the two together, and then you divide by two, and that's the result. The classic example that's always used in the you know, MPC world is the whole classical uh, millionaires problem, right? Very similarly designed problem, except that it's like Alice and Bob are just trying to figure out who has more money, right? The question I have is, so you know, what I would do is, okay, secret share both of them, subtract one from the other, and so if it's positive, one has more, if it's negative, the other has more. But how do I return this result to Alice and Bob without telling them the difference? I just want to tell them whether it's positive or negative. So is this something where now, like, oh, now I have to, com is there some other thing I have to use, like maybe a snark or something to prove maybe like the MPC computers, they don't want to give the end result. They want to show just that I have a snark to show you that the end result was negative. Or how does this work? So it's, you, you, you don't really need snark or anything for that. Let's take the simple. So the place where you need like zero knowledge proofs is if, and there are different ways to do it, is if you want the nodes to make sure that they run the computation correctly, right? Because if I'm a node, I have a share of the data, I need to, how do I know that one of the nodes didn't like switch its own share of the data with some random garbage or like with all zeros, right? That's where like, proofs come into play. But let's take the, the simple case. We call it a semi-honest case, where we assume the nodes, uh, we don't want them to learn more, more information than they have, which is their own share. But um, they won't go and do like those kind of Byzantine behavior type of things. So in that case, the computation is just more complicated. So there is a very known theorem, and it's very well known by now, that any computation any, any function, any computation that you have, you can basically translate that into a circuit of additions and multiplications 
and uh, you can basically compute any functionality. So in this case, and you can compute that without revealing any data that you don't want to. So in this case, what you would do, yes, you would subtract one from the other. The protocol is high level, goes like that. You subtract one from the other, then you need to make sure, is the result greater than zero or not? That's like the next step that the, that the nodes do together, which is more complicated. And uh, then they get like one bit as a result. It's either one or zero, true or false. So they don't have to leak more information. That result is also encrypted in the sense that each node has a share of that bit. It never leaked. Nothing more than that leaked to, to any of the nodes. That's very important. It gets a bit more complicated because the way that we work for security reasons is in what's known as uh, finite fields. So we don't really work under the integers. So the whole thing of like, you know, negative, non-negative, it doesn't, there's no order in finite field, finite fields. So there's another check that you need to see if like the, it, like the result wrapped around the field or not, which again gets a bit more complicated, but the point is you can do it. And the nodes can do it and they can get to the point where the end result is just one secret shared bit was, was A, was, you know, was uh, Alice's, is Alice richer than Bob, okay? And then they can return that. So no snarks, no anything, just pure old MPC. I see. Does this uh, process of running an MPC computation, right? Is it sort of, you know, I take the data, it gets split, everyone runs this like thing in parallel, and then there's one last final merge step? Or is there like a lot of communication needed between the computing nodes? So there's a lot of communication needed. That's, that's where basically MPC becomes less efficient, of course. That is the main trade-off of using MPC compared to something like trusted execution environment. Sure, we're, we've been making a lot of improvements. Like the academic literature in the, the last decade has made a lot of improvements. I and my thesis has ma have made also some improvements, and that's a, a continued process. And at Enigma, we're focusing a lot on how to improve it further. But that is the main cost. So in MPC, the way that it works is that uh, linear operations, which are basically addition, uh, multiplying by scalar, uh, that is like public, that kind of stuff, can be done locally, can be done without communication, and it's very cheap. It's basically free. We call it free. But whenever you want to do a multiplication by the way that the protocol works, the all nodes in the MPC protocol have to communicate with each other and kind of sync, sync with each other to be able to reach, uh, reach the, the end result. And every time you have a multiplication, you got to do that. So that is basically where MPC becomes you know, less efficient. And there are a lot of ways to improve that, but it is a, a fact of the protocol. So you, know, you, you, you secret share this thing. You, everyone has like a share of a polynomial with a certain degree. It's the issue is when you multiply two share multiply two polynomials of the same degree. Now you have a higher degree, and now you have to like somehow figure out to communicate to each other. Like, okay, how do we reduce the degree of this polynomial again? Is that essentially what the reason for this communication is? Yes, that is that is very very much correct. There's actually a more efficient uh, approach that's that's becoming heavily used called speeds, which we also employ. That approach basically uses another mechanism uh, instead of uh, the degree reduction. So what it basically does is it, you pre-process a lot of what's known as multiplication triplets. So you, you create random values of um, you know, C equals B times A. These A and Bs are completely random, and the C resulting is random as well. And you, you, you can batch these like offline very efficiently because it doesn't have to because it's not related to any comp any data in the computation, and then anytime you're doing multiplication, you consume one such what we call a triplet random triplet, and then you don't have to do a degree reduction. You can actually have a much more efficient protocol, and that's what we use. But yes, what you're saying is correct. That is the original reason why you need to do that. So to get like a intuitive understanding, what is the communication complexity, like, are we talking about, like, n squared with a very high constant? Are we talking about, like, n cubed? Or, or how does the, um, you know, as I want more nodes participating in the multi-party computation, how does my overhead uh, increase? 
So usually we like to talk about how many in, in like one round, how many values as a, you know, as a, as a factor of the nodes in the network, how many values are being communicated and worked on. So in the original protocol, which is called BGW, which is the degree reduction one, what you need to do is that every node basically needs to take its share and use that, reshare that, right? And then send one, uh, every other node in the network, one unique value. So you get n squared because like each node needs to send n unique values. So that's n times n, n squared. In the triplets protocol, what's interesting is that you only need to have n values. The reason is that every node just has to broadcast another uh, one value for all the nodes, all the peers in the protocol. So you only get n unique values. So that's an amazing improvement. Obviously, there's, you know, there, there's a question here. Is broadcast free or not, right? If you assume the broadcast is free, then it's just one value and it's completely linear. So it depends, really depends how you count it. But all of these are dependent on n, right, of the size. So in my thesis and in the original Enigma white paper, uh, and, and we've seen more and more protocols actually take this approach today, but back in 2015, this was super unique, and it is still unique in the context of MPC. We said, let the network grow. What we need, we need a first sampler, right, that can basically sample a group of MPC nodes for each computation, and then that group is constant size. The constant there is still high because for security, that, that group might be, you know, you might want a, a big enough group, but at least the scalability does not depend on how many nodes are in the network. All of this that we've been talking about now is in this security model that you you, you mentioned briefly, uh, the semi-honest model, where I'm kind of assuming that at least some percentage of the nodes, whatever my K percentage is, I guess, whatever, whoever I'm getting the data from, are non-Byzantine. They are at running the computation uh, correctly. One of the questions that I have, especially, you know, it kind of particularly due to my work at Cosmos and something that we're very particularly interested in is, is there a way to do MPC computation with attributability? So I can say that like, oh, if there's a Byzantine node that's trying to give me part of my computation, can we realize that they're like griefing by like, you know, changing everything to a zero or, and is there, can we actually figure out which of the nodes was the one who tried to grief everyone else? Yes, you definitely, you definitely can. And actually it's possible to have all nodes attributable. There are different techniques to do it. And um, I believe that in the system that we're building, we really need that. So like one third or half of my thesis actually focus on, you know, kind of formally proving that if you really want to create a system with like proper liveness and that, you know, continues to, to make progress, you, you got to be able to identify every, each and every node that, you know, misbehaves because you want to be able to penalize them. Because if that's not the case, you get freeloaders. And that's definitely not, not something that we can live with. So the answer is yes. And there are, but there are caveats, right? And this is where we're putting a lot of attention. The caveats are usually around efficiency. So there are two main systems, right, that, that I can propose at least for the sake of this, of this uh, conversation. There's what is known as detectable MPC. Detectable MPC basically says that even if one node misbehaves, you can detect that, right? You won't know which node, but you can detect that. For, this is great because at least, you know, we will never get the wrong results, which is very important. So no one can really behave in a Byzantine way, but it's hard to create incentives around it because it's not an attributable fault. It's not, what, it's not the next level of what's called identifiable MPC, which is like attributable MPC. It's the ability to uniquely say who cheated and, and when. So it turns out that we can do detectable MPC very efficiently. The nodes basically share some, some Mac key, and they kind of, as they, as they go through the computation, they also on the side compute over a computation that is multiplied by that Mac key. And at the end of the computation, you basically try to see if the result 
that you got in the real computation multiplied by that shared key evaluates to the, the, the Mac. And I mean, there's really no way to do it. The probability of that happening randomly is like, you know, uh, in, infinitesimally small. So that is a great way to detect, but you won't know who cheated. The other way is where other mechanisms like zero-knowledge proofs. And this is why I always say zero-knowledge proofs is complementary. It's not like, you know, it, it does a different thing. Zero-knowledge proofs, and especially Sakine uh, zero-knowledge proofs, could be very efficient in the sense that, let's say we ran a multi-party computation protocol. We detected that there's been a fault, but we don't know how to attribute that to one fault. Okay, now we can actually ask the nodes, okay, produce a proof that you run the computation correctly and in zero knowledge and probably in a second way, prove the blockchain that you did it correctly. If you didn't, the blockchain can then go verify this efficiently and penalize you. Uh, the problem why you probably don't want to do it every time is because zero knowledge proofs are super expensive. So I am, I am a big believer in taking what's known as an optimistic execution route. So do something fast. Just make sure that you can detect if something bad, really bad happened. And if that has happened, you can file a dispute. And you know, maybe you can do something like TrueBeat. Maybe you can do something like a zero knowledge proof. That's where I believe this can come in. But you can 100% do this. That's great. That's good news to hear. So there's also you know, one last question on the MPC side of things. There's this concept called fully homomorphic encryption. And I've always like, you know, I don't really know too much about it. I've always just heard jokes about how it's like a unicorn of computer science. Can you just quickly explain very briefly on what this fully homomorphic encryption is? Is it at all related to MP secure multi-party computation? Is it a subset or is it just something completely uh, different? So fully homomorphic encryption is another technique to basically compute over encrypted data. It is actually a, the, the cryptographic equivalent of trusted execution environments. You don't, so in MPC, you do that by not trusting one node, by, by taking a lot of untrusted nodes, and as a whole, you can trust them by, you know, secret sharing and all of that. With fully homomorphic encryption, it's basically a, a type of encryption that you can still run computations over data while it's encrypted. So this would be perfect, right? Like, I'm a user, I can encrypt my data, I can outsource it to one computer, we don't even need, well, we need decentralization for availability, but we don't need decentralization for anything, for the data privacy. Just send it to one computer, that one computer would compute over the encrypted data, would really not know what it is computing about. So you can see how this is very similar to trusted execution environments, but the guarantee is fully cryptographic. It's not by a secure hardware. This is what fully homomorphic encryption is. It allows you to fully compute in one node over encrypted data and then return an encrypted result. The problem is that it's very inefficient. It's very inefficient unless you're doing like maybe like a lot of additions. But again, when multiplications come into play, it turns out that this becomes like really inefficient. So for general purpose computation, it's just really theoretical. However, there has been places that, you know, somewhat homomorphic encryptions or like small, small circuits of homomorphic encryptions are being used today and is useful. And one example is in some MPC protocols. So for example, when I gave you the idea of how do you generate these random triplets uh, for MPC, this C equals A times B, it turns out that this is just one multiplication and a lot of additions so you can actually do that with fully homomorphic encryptions. So long story short, it's a different idea. It's inefficient at scale and general purpose, but we're using that in small things. It's actually even used in uh, ZK snarks in some small extent. So a bit earlier, we talked about the incentive models, and I'd like to come back to this uh, and specifically to talk about the token economics in Enigma. Uh, so there, there is a token. And for the, for the moment, uh, it is uh, an ERC-20 token uh, living on Ethereum. You mentioned earlier uh, that the token would at some point live on the Enigma blockchain. So one can assume that an, an Enigma sort of network, uh, an, a, a proprietary Enigma blockchain will exist in the future. Talk about the role of the token here 
uh, we've already we've already talked about uh, you know disincentivizing bad behavior, but you know broadly, what is the role of the token? The role of the token is really to maintain the security of the network. This is not unique to Enigma. It's very much like most blockchains. It's the idea that tokens uh, incentivize nodes for computations. So if I'm a user, you know, I'm, I'm executing a function in a secret contract, then I have to obviously send some payment, some fee, for whatever workers are running that computation. And the workers are getting incentivized you know, with, with Enigma tokens. So very similar to other blockchains. Uh, but at the same time, if nodes misbehave in the computation, then we need the ability to penalize them, which is why nodes need to also deposit the stake. Okay, and so can you give us an idea of like how that stake is calculated? Is it based on the complexity of the calculation, or is like how how does that work? So we're still determining the numbers, but the stake is most likely going to be bigger than, or even much bigger than whatever what the biggest computation could realistically be like. So uh, the the way we do this is we define network iterations in like pretty large epochs. Uh, we don't have to get into that. So, and we can imagine how many computations or how many steps can, you know, live inside one epoch and the stake has got to be larger than that. And what about for users? Uh, do we have an idea of how the, the computation price would be calculated and how much can, you know, if we if we come back to this voting mechanism example and sort of a, you know, somewhat simple, simple function like tallying up votes. What is you know a, an accurate representation of what that would cost uh, a user using the DAP? So right now it's calculated based on uh, just the same gas model as Ethereum. We are working on adjusting that. One thing we didn't discuss is that we're we're basically rewriting uh, all of the backend to be based on WebAssembly. We feel that's where the industry is going. And so the, you know, the, the, the cost model is going to have to change based on that. So we're working on it right now. Uh, it's also important for us because we're basically going to have two interpreters. We're going to have an interpreter for WASM inside the trusted execution environment, which is just a normal one. But we're going to have an interpreter that simulates multi-party computation as, as a WASM interpreter. So, so a WASM interpreter that does multi-party computation and that, it, that it has a different calculation. The reason, the reason in that is that, you know, let's say you have, we said comparing two numbers, right? Comparing two numbers in the trusted execution environment in Ethereum, it's, you know, one opcode, one operation. In MPC, it's going to be multiple operations and some network communication. So we got to factor that in. Still work in progress, but that's, that's the general idea. And is there an incentive uh, model to uh, incentivize uh, nodes to, to stay online, uh, basically an availability incentive? There is a penalty for that. So uh, the way that it works is that we sample different nodes, right, for different computations per epoch. Basically, there's like one epoch, an epoch could, let's say, uh, last a day. In that epoch, a group of nodes can, uh, are going to be in charge of computations for this smart contract, uh, for this secret contract. And we kind of shuffle them around. Now, uh, inside that epoch, we have smaller time windows that are known as timeouts. If, if a node does not respond to a computation request within that timeout, then it can be penalized. OK, interesting. So before we wrap up here, can you just uh, give us a brief overview of what are some significant milestones that you've reached uh, recently? Where is the project currently at? And what are some of the plans for the roadmap in the coming months? We released a testnet, the first one a few weeks ago. So that's actually very exciting. We have uh, a lot of projects and uh, partners that we're working with and that are trying the code and continuously giving us feedback. What we're seeing from that feedback is that a lot of our a lot of the assumptions that we made were like in terms of features are wrong and should need to evolve. And that is great. That is exactly what we wanted. 
So there are a lot of new features that we're working on right now that we didn't originally expect it to do, but that are like crucial uh, for developers. For example, having an encrypted state. So the way that the network works right now is that users can encrypt an argument, right? Then you can call a stateless, essentially a stateless function in Enigma. And the result of that stateless function is then being committed to Ethereum. But people want to be able to actually carry state, encrypted state, over and over. That, that comes up in, in many applications, you know, for example, a machine learning model, right? Like you want to you wanna be able to get some small chunk of data uh, in an encrypted form, take a, a currently encrypted model, and train that together. Uh, and then you want to you, you wanna maintain the, the new uh, encrypted model as it is at time 10. Then at time 11, you want to you know, evolve it a bit and save it at time 11. And you want to continuously keep that encrypted. A lot of use cases require that kind of encrypted state. Another thing that we're seeing is that you know, EVM is somewhat weak to a lot of the use cases that we want. So we are working very hard on moving to WebAssembly and many, many other aspects like that. We have a, a, a full list. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing that we're basically, the other two things that we're focusing on in 2018 are moving the state from Ethereum to moving the state to our own network and basically encoding the state in a way that fits Enigma, fits this idea of encrypted computations and makes it very efficient to that. That turns out to be a very non-trivial and difficult problem because no other blockchain project has had to keep the idea of encrypting the state and encrypting arguments in mind. And the third thing is actually continuing uh, work on the MPC interpreter and MPC functionality. The goal is in 2019 to enable what we call secret contracts 2.0 which is the ability to write uh, privacy-preserving smart contracts with uh, general-purpose multi-party computation. This move from the Ethereum blockchain to your own network, is this something that would also uh, allow uh, users to use Enigma with other smart contract platforms, you know, Ethereum Classic, Cardano, or whichever ones are to uh, emerge in the future? So that's what we want. The way we see it, we want Enigma to be a fully contained solution. And that is something that we evolved into. We realized that the only way to create, really make the right design choices is if we create a full solution including our own blockchain. But at the same time, we want other blockchain, we want to create bridges to other blockchains as well. That's something that we see as really important. But the way we think we should be doing that is basically through partnerships. Uh, I don't think we would have the core capacity to do that. The way is to talk to other projects. We have a partnership with Ion, for example. Uh, we've created the bridge to Ethereum because it you know, made sense, because a lot of people develop on Ethereum. But going forward, we want that to happen, but that would require collaboration with other projects. Great. Well, Guy, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it was great to talk to you and learn more about Enigma and how you guys are leveraging uh, trusted execution environments and, and doing multi-party computations. So these are topics that we've covered uh, quite a few times on the show. I mean, we've had Ari Jules on uh, a long, long time ago to talk about like uh, the town crier model that uses TEEs. And then we also had people from Microsoft uh, talk about Co um, Coco. And you know, we've, we've had Truebit. So like all, all these different technologies and everything that we've been able to learn so far are sort of coalescing in this, in this one project. So it's very, very uh, encouraging to see that. Thank you very much. It was great to be on the show. And thank you to our listeners for once again tuning in. Uh, you can find new episodes of Epicenter every week. Uh, we release to YouTube, uh, but also to iTunes, SoundCloud, and whatever podcast platform you uh, happen to listen to your podcasts on. Um, you can also uh, leave us, you know, reach us on Twitter at uh, Epicenter BTC. And if you're uh, looking to um, you know, support the show and encourage us in what we're doing, you can always leave us an iTunes review. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to see your reviews. So thank you very much. And we look forward to being back next week.